Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and indeed answers to match, please. Question one, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle low pay. Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, as Jackie Bailey will know, of course, by now, the Scottish Government has taken uh, considerable measures in respect of its own pay policy uh, in terms of government employees who are now all being paid the living wage. And indeed, there was an extra support put in place for those who were earning less than £21,000 per annum. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, fully supports the living wage campaign, uh, and we do recognise the real difference the living wage can make to uh, the people of Scotland. I may say that this government is the first and only government in the UK to include the living wage in its pay policy. Uh, we've funded the Poverty Alliance to increase the number of employers across all sectors in Scotland paying the living wage. And as of today, we've surpassed the target we set ourselves of 150 living wage accredited employers in Scotland. Uh, and we've made further commitments in our programme uh, for government uh, that include introducing a Scottish business pledge, making it clear that we do want companies to commit, amongst other things, to pay the living wage and to fair work. Many thanks, Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his, her response? She'll be aware that Scottish Labour set up a low pay commission last week because we're on a mission to abolish low pay and end exploitative zero hours contracts. We also want to pay people the living wage in public sector contracts and indeed much wider, something the SNP voted against five times in this chamber. Um, the current government promised a living wage summit way back in September 2014. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will it happen? Uh, a living wage summit is planned to take place uh, um, before the recess. Uh, we've also, of course, got Fair Work Convention, uh, which will uh, likely meet for the first time in April. Uh, and that will include discussions about the living wage, but we'll go further than that. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I can welcome the Labour Party to the ranks of those who are actively now campaigning for the living wage. Uh, they are working very hard to play catch up with this government, uh, but we do welcome all hands to this particular deck, presiding officer, uh, and therefore I'm grateful to hear the commitment. Many thanks. Neil Finlay. Uh, 43,000 workers are engaged in public sector contracts yet receive less than 7.85 an hour. Uh, what is the Fair Work Secretary uh, doing about that specific point? We are working within EU law to tackle the issue of payment of the living wage. Well, I, I hear the jeering uh, that suggests that the Labour Party isn't particularly interested in abiding by the law. And yet every single place where public bodies are being encouraged to promote the living wage quite clearly states that EU law will nevertheless take precedence in certain contracts. We're working extremely hard uh, to work through that in terms of procurement policy. Uh, and we're also working with COSLA in respect of uh, improving the quality of care in Scotland. And that means including looking at the uh, issue of, for example, uh, fair work and the living wage within a particular sector, which is traditionally not been particularly well remunerated. Uh, but we are doing so and we are doing it within the law and it doesn't matter how many times the Labour Party try to make an issue of this. The fact of the matter is we are bound by the law as they would be in government. Many thanks. Question two, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. To ask the Cabinet Secretary whether it will provide, she will provide an update on the work of the National Advisory Group on developing the young workforce. Cabinet Secretary. I chaired an excellent inaugural meeting of the Developing the Young Workforce National Advisory Group last month. Uh, its members heard from Sir Ian Wood about the ambitions set out in his report and from each other about their personal commitment to supporting young people into fulfilling jobs. And we're now working with members uh, to support their role in promoting what Developing the Young Workforce can offer young people, teachers and employers. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. In December last year, the Cabinet Secretary called for an apprentice's minimum wage of more than £3 an hour. She will undoubtedly want to welcome the rise introduced by the UK Government, raising it to £3.30. Can I ask what the Cabinet Secretary plans to do to arrest the 34% decline in the STEM college places since they came into office, considering the importance of these places to our economy? 
Mr. Secretary. I'm already on record as welcoming the increases that were made last week in uh, the minimum wage. I don't believe they go far enough, and I certainly don't believe they go far enough in respect of uh, apprentices, which is something I have also uh, made absolutely clear. Uh, in terms of uh, college uh, uh, and the work towards STEM, uh, this, uh, this government is working very hard with colleges and with schools and with employers to make sure that there is a big focus uh, on STEM apprentices. Uh, and indeed, my, uh, my colleague and myself uh, visit many employers who are actively looking to recruit. And in just last week, perhaps the week before, we met training providers uh, on this particular issue as well. Um, we have to move things along. Uh, that is the case. But we are working very hard to do so. Many thanks. Question three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to achieve parity of esteem between academic and vocational education as recommended by the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. Cabinet Secretary. The ambition of developing the young workforce, Scotland's youth employment strategy, is rooted in our vision that whether a young person's route to work is academic or vocational, as traditionally defined, is not significant. Our strategy sets out activity based on a rich variety of high-quality learning opportunities linked to skills needs and employer demands and taken up by informed young people making smart decisions about the best route for them to obtain fulfilling jobs. Alison Johnston. Thank you. It's really important that people value vocational subjects and the jobs they lead to. The national minimum wage, however, does not, and the minimum wage for apprentices remains astonishingly low and sends entirely the wrong message to young people. The Minister clearly agrees that raising the minimum wage for apprentices is a vital part of delivering this parity of esteem, and that while the recent rise is welcome, £3.30 an hour, less than half the standard minimum wage, is nowhere near a living wage. Will she continue to push the UK Government on this issue and right to ask for a living wage for our apprentices? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we do continue to push the, uh, uh, the UK Government on this, and indeed I did so as recently as last week, uh, as it happens. Um, the Scottish Government, in terms of its own pay policy, pays all its apprentices at the living wage rate. Uh, it, the, the, the member might be uh, unaware that living wage accreditation does not actually include apprentice pay. Um, but we, when we are talking to employers about living wage accreditation, are always encouraging them to include apprentices in that. And indeed, just this morning, the company that I visited, uh, who that have just become accredited living wage, have extended that policy to all their apprentices. And that's an example we would want all employers in Scotland to follow. Many thanks. Question four, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to open up opportunities for young people to work in civil engineering. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Skills Development Scotland has been working with the Construction Industry Training Board to develop a Foundation Apprenticeship Pathfinder for Civil Engineering Technicians, which is to start in August 2015. Uh, delivered in conjunction with West Lothian College, this Pathfinder will allow young people to undertake relevant work-based learning during their senior phase of school. Additionally, uh, Skills Development Scotland will shortly publish a skills investment plan for the construction sector, setting out a range of actions to attract and to retain a skilled workforce to support the continuing growth of the sector. Mary Fee. I thank the Minister for that answer. We know that attracting young women into the industry is a problem, and that's been repeated to me when, I, when meeting civil engineering companies. Can the Minister tell the Chamber how many women have entered civil engineering apprenticeships in the last 12 months, and what specific work will be undertaken to ensure take-up of young women in those apprenticeships? Minister. Uh, th uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in terms of the, uh, the first question and, and the number of uh, females entering civil engineering apprenticeships in the last 12 months, I do not have that figure to hand, Presiding Officer, and I'm happy to have a, uh, a written communication to the member on that. Uh, on the second question that the member asked in terms of what we are doing to uh, encourage uh, more women into uh, civil engineering apprenticeships, I would uh, point out to the member that the Foundation Apprenticeship Pathfinder uh, program that I mentioned a moment ago uh, aims to tackle the gender imbalance in the sector and to encourage more young women into engineering careers. Uh, what we will see is hopefully that of the 32 young people who will be, be beginning in Senior 5 uh, this two-year foundation apprenticeship, 50% uh, 
of them will be female. Additionally, uh, as regards the uh, 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 shortly to be announced uh, skills investment plan in the construction sector, uh, a key focus of the action plan uh, will be not just uh, attracting young people towards opportunities in the construction sector, but also particularly the focus will be on how to address underrepresentation across uh, the construction workforce. And finally, I would just add uh, that the member may be interested to note that I attended this very Monday uh, an excellent event uh, uh, hosted in Glasgow City Council Chambers uh, in conjunction with uh, Rail Track, uh, with Network Rail, uh, where there were some 82 uh, young uh, women from secondary schools across Glasgow participating in an Engineering Your Future event. I, I think it was a very successful event and hopefully uh, these kinds of events, presiding officer, can engender enthusiasm uh, for uh, young women to look to the construction sector as a career. Many thanks. Question five, David Torrance. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many modern apprenticeships it supports in the Kirkcaldy Parliament constituency. Mr. Um, the Scottish Government supports uh, any apprentice aged 16 to 24 following an approved modern apprenticeship framework uh, and those aged 25 and above in selected key growth and enabling sectors. Uh, our national skills body, Skills Development Scotland, uh, does not collect data based on parliamentary uh, constituency level, but rather by local authority area. And I can therefore tell the member that in 2013-14, there were 1,927 modern apprenticeship starts in Fife. Uh, in the first three quarters of 2014-15, there were 1,252 modern apprenticeship starts in Fife. As at the end of December 2014, there was a total of 2,704 apprentices in training in Fife. Many thanks. David Torrens. I thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister agree that small local businesses can play an integral part in the development of apprenticeship schemes, while simultaneously ensuring that they pay, they pay a living wage to their employees? Would the Minister or Cabinet Secretary agree to visit one such small local business within my constituency? Minister. Um, I can absolutely agree with uh, David Torrance that small businesses can benefit tremendously from employing a modern apprentice and I am aware that there are many such businesses across Fife and Scotland that are providing these fantastic opportunities for young people to earn a wage while working towards an industry recognised qualification. Of course it's already been said by the Cabinet Secretary today again that as a government we fully support the living wage campaign and encourage all employers across Scotland regardless of size, sector or location to pay at least the living wage. Uh, I'm very pleased indeed to hear about the company to which uh, David Torrance refers in his constituency of Kirkcaldy and I of course um, would be delighted to take up his offer to visit uh, this company to discuss their experience of the MA programme and to see how we can use this positive experience to cover, encourage other small companies to get involved and I will have my private office contact David Torrance with a view to setting up such a visit. Excellent. Question six, Willie Colfey. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the Investors in Young People scheme. Minister. Uh, the latest uh, figures from Investors in, in uh, People Scotland indicate that since its launch, the Investors in Young People accreditation scheme, uh, accreditation rather, has been awarded to 93 employers across Scotland uh, and around 190 are currently in discussion or working with Investors in People Scotland towards accreditation. As the member for Kamarnock and Irvine Valley may be particularly interested to learn, 10 of these accreditations involve employers located in Ayrshire. Uh, amongst these are Anco Limited in Irvine uh, and uh, also the Ayrshire Chamber of Commerce. The coffee. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, with that positive news uh, and the recently announced funding of six and a half million pounds to improve youth employment. Is the Minister confident that we will continue to see good progress in this area of youth employment, particularly in my constituency of Kilmarnock and Northern Valley? Uh, what I can say to the member is that this government is absolutely determined to do all that we can to ensure uh, that we continue to progress uh, uh, with uh, uh, seeing more opportunities available to our young people. Uh, what we have seen in terms of recent labour market statistics is a continuing trend which shows uh, that uh, levels of youth uh, unemployment are at their lowest for some five years and levels of youth employment and indeed levels of uh, youth inactivity uh, outperform uh, the rest of the UK. Um, in terms of the uh, specific Investors in Young People scheme, I do believe that this does have a role uh, in encouraging employers to develop young people. Uh, and we can see that of 
uh, uh, many of the employers who have themselves achieved accreditation, uh, they are reported to be actively engaged in encouraging, encouraging other employers to follow. So that is one measure that can help and indeed this government is pursuing many other uh, measures to uh, ensure that we give our young people all opportunities that they can expect to make their way in life in the world of work. Any thanks. Uh, question 7 in the name of Roderick Campbell has not been lodged and while we have an explanation I regret to say it's not a satisfactory one. Question 8, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it gives to 16 to 25 year olds who are not in education, employment or training. Secretary Under Cunningham. this government, we now have the highest number of young people successfully moving to a positive de uh, destination from school. Youth unemployment rates are at a five year low, but we are still more ambitious and settling for a return to pre recession levels. Uh, we recognise that periods of unemployment or inactivity on a young person can have a significant impact on their future life chances uh, and that that is why tackling youth unemployment and increasing young people's participation in learning, training and employment remains a priority. With our national and local partners, we will continue to deliver programmes that are based on the principles of early intervention, such as the Opportunities for All Commitment, the Youth Employment Scotland Fund, Community Jobs Scotland and expanding our modern apprenticeship programme. Thank you. Anne McTaggart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response and ask um, further what specific measures can be implemented in order to lower and reduce the percentage of young people in Glasgow leaving school and not pursuing additional education, employment or training? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that is a, is a very good issue to raise because uh, it does mean that there has to be a partnership between colleges, schools and indeed parents as well as employers. It is uh, part and parcel of how we want to approach uh, in, regional, uh, in regional areas. There is a, a Glasgow Invest in Young People uh, group and I hope that the member will engage directly with them. It was set up about a month ago uh, and I, I think it would be helpful if she uh, talk directly to them. Uh, the important thing is that we actually get people talking uh, in the early years of secondary school about where they're intending to go instead of them just falling out of school with no real constructive approach to, to what's happening. Uh, and that's where we're focusing as much of our effort as we possibly can. We've got a very good record in Scotland in terms of inactivity rates uh, uh, um, and low uh, unemployment rates as opposed to the rest of the UK but we still have a lot to do uh, and a lot more can be done. Many thanks. Question nine, Chick Brodie. Thank you. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase training and apprenticeship provision in the care industry. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, the Government has committed to increase our target for modern apprenticeship starts from 25,000 each year to 30,000 by 2020. Increasing the overall number of starts will offer more choice to people considering a career in the care industry in particular and the wider economy in general. The availability of modern apprenticeship opportunities is, of course, reliant upon demand uh, from employers. Uh, in recognition of the importance of the sector to the economy, uh, uh, from care in early years through, straight through to free personal care for the elderly, from uh, April two th uh, 2015, funding will be available through Skills Development Scotland for apprentices aged 25 and above, following the Health and Social Care Modern Apprenticeship Framework. Check Brody. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answer? The integration of health care and, uh, and, and social care and future demographics will demand high quality, high performance outcomes from the care sector. Can she tell me what recent discussions she has had with uh, has the government and its agencies had with training providers in the sector with these eventual outcomes in mind? Minister. I, I would say to the member that uh, it's important to note that uh, obviously a key success of the MA programme is that it is indeed responsive to employer demands. Uh, and therefore, as such, it is important that it meets the needs and standards of the sector. There are now seven individual apprenticeship frameworks available in health and social care, which have been developed by the Scottish Social Services Council, providing clear work-based routes for the sector from SCQF level six to 10. This includes the recently approved professional apprenticeship in care services leadership and management at SCQF level 10, providing a progression route for employees in this important area. In line with the recommendations from the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce, Skills Development Scotland is undertaking research to identify future demand to support the expansion of the modern apprenticeship programme. The Scottish uh, Social Services Council, employers, together with training providers uh, operating in the care sector, were consulted on this work. Uh, the SSC uh, was also surveyed in relation to demand 
uh, to inform ME contracting strategy for 2015-16 and SDS has also met uh, with them recently to discuss MA quality assurance. Additionally, the member may find it of interest to note that SDS also attends the NHS Modern Apprenticeship Network, which aims to promote, promote modern apprenticeships in the sector, as well as encouraging health boards to recruit modern apprentices. To be quick, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made towards achieving the target of at least 150 living wage accredited employers in Scotland as set out in the programme for government. As Bob Doris now knows, uh, given my earlier answer, we reached the target today. Uh, this morning I visited CMS Windows in Cumbernauld, uh, who are indeed the 150th living wage accredited employer in Scotland. They already have a strong record on recruitment and youth employment, and they're setting a strong example to other employers uh, and showing that ensuring staff are paid fairly is no barrier to business growth. I will now work with the Poverty Alliance presiding officer to set even more stretching targets uh, for accreditation. And I look forward to seeing a lot more organisations committed to pay the living wage in the future. Very good. Bob Doris. Uh, that's fantastic news, Cabinet Secretary. But I'm contacting the Poverty Alliance to draw to their attention that no large supermarket chain or small convenience store has yet got themselves accredited as living wage employers. In Glasgow region, the sector employs over 3,000 workers. Some of the lowest paid workers are likely to work in that sector. Does the Cabinet Secretary support my representation to the Poverty Alliance for them to engage with this sector to support them to work towards paying at least a living wage to all their staff and to work constructively with organisations such as the Scottish Grocers Federation in doing so? So the short answer to that would be yes. Uh, uh, we work constantly with Poverty Alliance and with those sectors where there are very significant challenges in getting to uh, living wage status, status simply because we're starting from such a low base. However, there are many more employers paying the living wage than are accredited. And uh, this government is about making sure that people understand that accreditation is the gold star that they can get for paying the living wage. Many thanks. And we now move to portfolio questions on social justice, communities and pensioners' rights. Question one, Gil Patterson. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the content of the report Severe Poverty in Scotland in relation to severe or extreme poverty among children. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Presiding Officer, last week we published Severe Poverty in Scotland, which showed that in 2012 13, 710,000 people were living in severe or extreme poverty after housing costs. That included half a million working age adults, 150,000 children, and 60,000 pensioners. This is a disgrace, but as I said last week, it's an inevitable result of the UK's failed austerity agenda and welfare cuts that are slashing incomes for some of our poorest households. Whilst we know that employment significantly reduces the risk of severe and extreme poverty, in work poverty nevertheless remains a problem. That is why we are committed to supporting people into fairly paid work and are doing what we can to mitigate the impact of welfare reform. This includes investing around £296 million from 2013-14 to 2015-16 to limit the damage of the cuts and the changes. However, we cannot fully mitigate all the effects. Patterson. The Cabinet Secretary for that answer. With the growing weight of evidence, including the reports commissioned from Sheffield Hallam University by West, the Westminster uh, Welfare Reform Committee, titled welfare re uh, reform hitting poorest people hardest and the cumulative impact of welfare reform on households in Scotland with a continuing austerity uh, following George Osborne's uh, budget, which Ed Balls has said he would Christian. not reverse. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that this budget will have a devastating impact on the vulnerable people in Scotland and only push more people, particularly children, into poverty? Presiding officer, I do. We have long voiced concerns that the UK government's austerity agenda is hitting the most vulnerable people hardest. The cumulative impact of Westminster's welfare reforms alone could result in the Scottish Welfare Bill being cut by around £6 billion over the six years to 2016, yet George Osborne would go further, as would Ed Balls. The Scottish Government is doing what it can with the resources and powers it has to help those affected, and this includes investing around £296 million, as I said earlier, to limit the damage over the two-year period, hence, of the UK Government's reforms. We cannot fully mitigate all the effects of welfare changes, but we are doing our best. The best mitigation would be to transfer all the welfare powers to this Parliament. 
Thank you. Question two, Stuart Maxwell. To ask the Scottish Government what meetings it has had with representatives of religious organisations who are denied pension credit as they are fully maintained by their order. Mr Margaret Burgess. This Government is aware of the issues in relation to pension credit and those fully maintained by the religious order. As the Member will be aware, all aspects of the state pension and pension credit are reserved to the UK Government and concerns about eligibility or other issues need to be taken up with UK Ministers. Uh, 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 can I thank the Minister for the answer? I, had, I have a letter from the Cabinet Secretary, uh, John Swinney, dated the 20th of February, saying that uh, in order to understand the specific issue that you have raised, and this is previous correspondence from myself, I have asked my officials to arrange to meet with representatives of the groups affected to discuss their concerns and the potential next steps. Um, I, I did not hear in the answer um, what meetings had, been, had taken place between Scottish Government officials and the orders affected. But the Minister maybe can help me in this. Everyone in the UK who is between the ages of 65 and 80 is entitled to receive pension credit, apart from two classes of people, prisoners and members of religious orders who are fully maintained by their order. In practice, this means a very small number of people are affected by this particular loophole, in my opinion. Um, can, the, uh, can the Minister tell me whether uh, she believes it's correct and fair that uh, people who reach the age of pension, age of 65 or 66, are not entitled to any support from the state between the, the, that age and the age of 80 because they have joined an enclosed religious order? And does she believe that actually the UK government should tackle this matter? And will she take this matter up with the UK government as a matter of uh, urgency? Thank you, Margaret um, I'm certainly willing to take this matter up with the UK government uh, and address the issues. We have had contact before with the UK government in terms of how they intend to address this. We recognise there is a, an issue there and a problem there, and I am certainly willing to take it up today. I give that commitment. I will raise the matter with the UK government and pass on my response to the member. Thank you. Question three, Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what guidance it has issued to planning authorities regarding the provision or expansion of primary health care facilities as a consequence of residential development. Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil. Presiding Officer, the, we have issued general guidance to planning authorities in the use of planning obligations to support development delivery. We will publish guidance on planning for infrastructure, including health care facilities, later this year. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Concerns have been raised with me that often when uh, large-scale developments are proposed, um, there is not prior consultation between developers and health boards and primary care providers such as GP practices about the implications of those developments in terms of the impact on existing facilities and also the space requirements within those developments in relation to the construction of new facilities with often not enough space being allocated for sufficient facilities to be developed. Is that something Something the Cabinet Secretary is aware of, and is it something he will look to build into the work that he's doing ahead of the, uh, the uh, guidance he's hoping to publish in due course? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I'm both aware of the problem, and I was as Health Secretary as well as the Social Justice Secretary, and we are looking at how we can deal with that. At the present time, there are no such specific requirements for prior discussion and consultation with health boards and GP practices during the pre-application process. But my view is, as key agencies, health boards should be actively engaged in the preparation of strategic and local development plans. Uh, early engagement is essential if the impact of development in healthcare facilities is to be properly planned and, where appropriate, paid for through the use of planning obligations. Thank you. Question four, Graven Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the budget priorities are for the social justice, communities and pensioners' rights portfolio in 2015-16. The presiding officer, the budget priorities for the social justice communities and pensioners' rights portfolio in 2015-16 includes work to tackle poverty and inequality, progress equality and deliver more and better housing and to take forward delivery of new social security powers for Scotland. Gavin Brown. I'm grateful for that answer. Uh, what is the budget for the pensioners' rights part of the portfolio? Neil. Presiding officer, I am happy to give a breakdown of the entire budget and the included in pensioners' rights is part of the equalities budget, which is a uh, twenty million pounds next year. Thank you very much, Ken McIntosh. 
Can I ask the Minister if he shares Labour's support for the Scotland Against the Care Tax campaign, uh, which is campaigning against the 12% rise in care charges imposed across Scotland last year? And if so, what priority will he give addressing the needs of this campaign in his budget? Alec Neil. Uh, presenting officer, this matter is under discussion between my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, uh, as well as other Cabinet colleagues, because we do accept that there is an issue to be addressed here. And if I may say so, the worst area for this has been Glasgow, where the Labour-controlled Glasgow City Council has jacked up care charges to an astronomical level. Many thanks. Question five, Jane Baxter. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact on poverty of Fife Council's decision to abolish social care charges. Mr Margaret Burgess. Okay. Uh, local authorities have autonomy to set or waive charges for non-residential social care within the context of COSLA's charging guidance. The Scottish Government has not conducted any assessment of the impact of Fife Council's decision on charging for social care. However, as part of our programme for government, we outlined a commitment to ensuring all new and revised Scottish Government policies will be subject to a poverty impact assessment. Thank you. Jane Baxter. I thank you for that answer. Um, Labour-led Fife Council last year abolished housing support charges for its own sheltered housing tenants. And as of yesterday, it is the case that housing associations sheltered housing tenants in Fife, some 101 at present, will no longer pay housing support charges. Fife Council is managing this despite the ongoing cuts it has to make. What is the Cabinet Secretary's position on the possibility of other councils following the lead of Fife Council in reversing charges to one of the most vulnerable groups in society? Minister. Okay. Um, as I said to the member in my previous answer, local authorities have the autonomy to set or waive charges for non-residential social care, including uh, housing support charges. The Scottish Government is in continual uh, dialogue with COSLA about charges, about uniformity of charges and when they should be applied. And that is a, that is a consultation that continues. We all want to see um, charges. If, if there are to be charges, we want to ensure that they are affordable and that there are, the, the services provided are of a high quality and the services that are required. But we continually, as, as the Cabinet Secretary said a few minutes ago, all of these issues are under discussion. Thank you. Question six, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary what steps the Scottish Government are taking to ensure that the planning process for projects is as streamlined as possible. McNeil. Presiding Officer, we continue to work in partnership with our stakeholders to deliver a range of coordinated actions to streamline planning. This includes the planning performance framework, e-planning, improvement projects and legislation. Thank you. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? And can I ask him if he agrees with me that in order to ensure that we continue to see a diverse range of projects going through the planning process across all our communities here in Scotland, the process should be streamlined, easy to participate in and encourage continued development of our communities, something which I am sure we would all want to see. Presiding officer, I totally agree with the member and as he knows we've made a number of reforms to the planning process in recent years but I believe further reform may be necessary in different aspects to achieve a better and more streamlined planning system and we're working with stakeholders on a series of ideas and recommendations that they have made to us. Many thanks. Question 7, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it will spend the £14 million announced in the budget uh, for low-cost home energy efficiency loans. Mr Margaret Burgess. Uh, presiding Officer, the interest-free loan scheme will be used to provide financial assistance to private sector households looking to install energy efficiency measures through the provision of a government-backed loan. It will support our efforts to tackle fuel poverty, improve the energy efficiency of our housing stock, reduce carbon emissions and support the green economy. This funding is part of our record 114 million funding commitment in 2015-16 and forms part of our half a billion pound allocation to fuel poverty and energy, energy efficiency programmes since 2009. Details of the loan scheme will be announced shortly. Thanks. Rob Gibson. 
Thank you, President Officer. I, and thank the Minister. I very much welcome this improvement for household energy efficiency. Uh, we'll see how it rolls out. Since it has an important role to play in our efforts to address fuel poverty and climate change emissions, can the Minister tell me what plans the Scottish Government has to build in future on this welcome investment so as to make sure that even more people are taken out of uh, fuel poverty? Thank you, Minister. Okay, thank you. Um, we will certainly intend to evaluate the effectiveness of the loan scheme in both tackling fuel poverty and improving the energy efficiency of housing stock, and in due course consider if schemes like this have a long-term role to play. But our commitment to tackling fuel poverty uh, is, is, is there and remains, and improving energy efficiency also. It is evident from the over half a billion pounds we have allocated to this since 2009 and is further emphasised by our record £114 million budget in this financial year. Consideration of any future schemes will take account of broader uh, priorities on sustainability and fuel poverty and in the context of the future spending review. Many thanks. Question 8, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle poverty. Mr Margaret Burgess. Okay. We are committed to tackling the long-term drivers of poverty through early intervention and prevention. That is why building a fairer Scotland and tackling inequality was one of the three key aims of the programme for government. As part of that programme, we are promoting the living wage across all sectors, delivering on our commitment to 600 hours of free childcare for three and four year olds and eligible two year olds. In addition, we are providing 25,000 modern apprenticeship places every year and are investing around £296 million from 2013 14 to 15 16 to help those affected by the UK Government's welfare reforms. We have also made a commitment to ensuring all new and revised Scottish Government policies will be subject to a poverty impact assessment and to appointing an independent adviser on poverty and inequality to advise on further actions needed to tackle poverty and hold the Government to account on its performance. Thank you. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, Minister is correct. Yesterday, the Scottish Government's own uh, Wealth and Assets Survey uh, emphasised just how extreme inequality is in our country and in response they did indeed announce that they would appoint an independent advisor on poverty and inequality to raise awareness of the realities of living in poverty. Does the Minister not think that those who live in poverty are well aware of the realities of it and what they need is more support? Yesterday Labour announced plans for a £175 million Scottish anti-poverty fund in the next Parliament over and above those measures elaborated by the Minister, will she support this measure? Minister. Um, the Scottish Government is tackling the drivers of poverty uh, and the, the prevention of poverty and simply not just going to move mitigation from one budget within the Scottish Parliament to mitigating it in another way. We want to address it. We want to address poverty, deal with poverty. And the drivers of poverty, not just mitigate it, and that's what our plans are set out to do. And that's why the First Minister announced in the programme of government that will be a poverty advisor to look across the whole of government policies to ensure that everything this government d does, the, the, po the poverty aspect is looked at, and we're not uh, we're addressing it every across all portfolios of government. Um, so therefore, what I would say to, to Ken McIntosh is we are dealing with it, we have been tackling it. No, to, sorry to Ken McIntosh, to Ian um, Gray, is that we are tackling this matter and will continue to tackle it and not just jump in something that came up yesterday by mitigating from one way and mitigating in another way. We want to do more than mitigating, we want to address it. Hey, thanks. Question 9, Annabel Goldie what action it is taking to increase the number of housing completions. Mr Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government has set a five-year target to deliver 30,000 affordable homes and have backed this up with plans to spend over £1.7 billion over the lifetime of this Parliament. We are continuing to work creatively with our partners and use innovative ways to deliver more affordable homes. We are supporting a wide range of action to boost the supply of housing, working in partnership with Homes for Scotland and industry to support private sector recovery and growth. Thanks. Annabel Goldie. 
I thank the Minister for her response. The reality is that uh, 10,000 fewer houses were completed in 2014 than in 2007 when this government came to power. But there is another downside, Deputy Presiding Officer, and that is that residential development is often concentrated in traditional communities uh, like my own, placing impossible pressure on infrastructure. So what in theory is sustainable development is in practice anything but what plans does the Scottish Government have for a housing policy based on diffusion to spread more development amongst more communities and so mitigate the current oppressive overload on infrastructure in some communities? Minister. The, the local authorities are the strategic housing provider and their plans uh, show where they are looking at the houses and how they should spread it out in their local authority area. They are responsible for saying what kind of houses are required and where the houses will be built. Um, and further to, to what Anna Belt Goldie said a few moments ago, we actually have completed 901 more homes in the year to, uh, to September 2014 than the year to. to September 2013. We are building more homes. We are building more homes per head of population across all sectors and tenures in Scotland than, than in the rest of the UK. And I think that's something that should be welcomed. Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on Scotland's energy future, achieving security of supply and a balanced energy mix.